Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're at today. Welcome, welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute here. We're not quite at the top of the hour, but we thought we would open the doors a smidge early. Um, as you're coming in, what we love to do is tell us a little bit about yourself. So use the chat function. What city are you in? What's your weather? I'm in Minneapolis. It's overcast. We're supposed to get rain today. So um, I'm here with with uh, with Crystal and we will get started in just a minute. Crystal, how about you? What's the weather where you're at? Hey, everybody. Great to see you or see you in the chat. Put in there where you are. I would love to know. I am in Texas, so you already know what I'm dealing with in the Houston area. And two weeks ago, it was 113. <laughs> it was 113. I could not take it. And I'm a Florida girl. It just did not feel the same. So I am hot That's down hot. here in Houston. I have a fan on me now as we speak. So yeah. it is, it's a lot to deal with, but glad to be here and glad to tell you more about remote fundraising. That is great. I love it. You have a fan and I have my bloomerang blanket on my lap because I'm in my basement and it's chilly down here. So <laughs> we have people joining from all over Kentucky, Canada. I saw Wisconsin, Long Island, New York, Nova Scotia, lots of Canadians. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Sometimes we have people um, joining all the way from Africa. So let's see how far around the globe we can get today. So um, we're really excited um, to have everyone here today. We will just give it a minute because I know people are just joining. We'll give it well, you know, another minute and then we'll jump right in because we have got a lot to cover today and it's going to be a fabulous hour here with crystal frazier um and we'll get going in a second look at this yeah, i see a fellow floridian i see someone from houston as well wow cool fort worth okay south carolina chicago i'll be there next year sometime absolutely visiting so yeah welcome everybody yeah vancouver island I'll Canada. This is great. Lots of fabulous locations. Beautiful and sunny in Michigan. Love it. Summer. Wow. Leesburg, Florida. Not many people know where that's. I know exactly where you are. It's not far from my hometown. So glad to see you yeah, in Seattle. I always wanted to go to Seattle, actually been there a few times it's been it's been a while since uh, I saw some uh, Portland Oregon as well I used to do a lot of business in Portland so welcome welcome okay all right well I think we should get this show started we're we're, we're right on the cusp uh, we've got a lot to cover today I'm going to go ahead and get in slideshow mode here and I'm going to share my screen for just a minute or two for some introductions so you all should see this. All right. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Ann Feldman. I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at Bloomerang. And I am so excited because over the last couple of months, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Crystal Frazier, our speaker today. She's been so gracious with her time. She is going to share with us her expertise and insight on remote fundraising using the three T's of communication. Mm -hmm. And so again, get to know each other. We have a fabulous, you all are wonderful people. And this is, it's so fun in the chat. So use the chat to introduce yourself. Um, you know, share if you've got questions for the community. It's such a wonderful group of people that are sharing their tips and tricks and best practices. So don't be shy um, to engage and communicate through the chat function with each other. And so with that, let's just for take one second so I can just tell you what we're going to do today, if I can get there we go. So just a few housekeeping items. We are recording and we will send out the recording and the slides and some follow up materials to you after Crystal's presentation. So um, keep that in mind and we'll we'll share that throughout because I know sometimes um, we have late uh, attendees. And then also, 
when you have questions, so we're going to do some polling, so get ready to be engaging and interactive. Um, so feel free to always use a chat question, but the best place to get your questions to Crystal so we can answer them live, use the Q&A tab within your Zoom console here. So just click that little Q&A button and you can ask the question and that way we can just see them all lined up. Sometimes we, we, uh, we run out of time, so then we come up with creative ways to answer your questions after the fact. So um, those are the few housekeeping items. So just two seconds on Bloomerang and what we're all about. So Bloomerang is donor relationship management software, really helping you manage that entire life cycle of your donors. We're built for um, small and mid-sized nonprofits. And Bloomerang was started, built by, and built for fundraisers. So built by fundraisers for fundraisers. And at the end of the day, what Bloomerang is all about, we're here to um, make fundraising easier. We're here to help you foster authentic donor relationships and help your nonprofit organization thrive. At the end of the day, that's what we're all about. So with that, though, um, you know, we've got more than 14,000 nonprofits today, uh, the privilege to serve them. Many of you are here today, so thank you for that. This is a little screenshot of the dashboard within Bloomerang, but don't go there right now. We can, you can learn more about Bloomerang later. That is not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk to Crystal Frazier and learn from Crystal. And so I want to just do a little intro. Crystal, uh, she's the queen of conversation, as I like to say. She's just a wonderful human being, really easy to get to know. So she's also the founder of the Assertive Ask uh, fundraising performance system. And that's used by licensed trainers to help organizations fund, sustain, and grow. Crystal has this talent for coaching critical thinkers, thought leaders. Um, she's a phenomenal speaker, and you'll see that here in a second. But really around cultivating the investors, the funders, and the donors, she's got uh, years and years of experience and success. And um, they, thousands of people have benefited from Crystal's assertive ask fundraising performance system. She's really, Crystal, you're, you're an inspiration to many of us. We're so honored and humbled that you're here today. She's warm. Uh, her insights are amazing and, and your expansive knowledge. So we cannot wait to learn from you. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and hand, hand the mic over to Crystal and take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you for that awesome introduction. I am humbled and I am glad to be here. I really am. I love Bloomerang. They are very near and dear to my heart. And I've been doing webinars for uh, quite some time for Bloomerang. And so I'm glad to bring you remote fundraising. So I've been in fundraising for, used to say 10 years, a little closer to the 15 mark right now, showing my age a little bit. That's okay, but I love fundraising. I love teaching other people that it doesn't have to be difficult and it does not have to be a obstacle if you're an introvert teaching you how to make the ask and using tools that'll make it easier in your efforts. Because let's face it, I know most of you on here are wearing 15 hats. As soon as this webinar is over, there is something else you need to do. Uh, for your fundraising efforts. I understand that. I know that. I used to be in the thick of it. So I want to teach you what I have learned about remote fundraising and how my remote fundraising has changed over the years. And I'm going to give you a day in the life of a fundraiser right now. So let me share my screen. And if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat and we will answer them periodically. Okay. So let me go to here. All right. So we have the full presentation up. So remote fundraising using the three T's of communication. This is also the three T's of donor engagement, the three T's of fundraising right now, okay? So there's a lot that I'm gonna pack into the presentation. That's why your questions are so important. There are certain parts of remote fundraising that I want to teach you that it's easier for you to navigate, okay? Let's go past all this. You don't care about that stuff. Agenda. This is what we're going to talk about today. 
we're going to back up a little bit when it comes to remote fundraising because I'd say the top 10, this is in the top 10 questions I get on a regular basis, is how do I do prospect research? I started out using these prospect research systems years ago. I don't do that anymore, okay? I wanna show you another way, a new age way of prospect research methods. Next is virtual donor engagement, okay? Next is sensitivity and modern day fundraising. Why is this important? Because everybody's been through something in the last few years, okay? That is also applicable to your donors. So sensitivity and modern day fundraising. Block scheduling for fundraisers. This is the block I use currently. I wanna show you how I schedule my day and you use whatever part is applicable to you or that might help you in your efforts. Tact, tone, and timing. Those are the three T's. We're gonna talk about them. Virtual fundraising script. Okay, I started this years and years ago when as a introvert, grew up as an introvert, kind of needed to become extroverted to do fundraising to make the ask. How do I do that? Through a script and I'll show you how. And online campaigns, I want to show you the five steps that will help you bring your campaigns online. And then of course your question and answers. So that's our agenda. The best way to get the answers you need is to ask me in the chat, okay? So next is prospect research methods. So when it comes to this, we wanna do three things. That's connect, research, and identify, okay? That is what you're doing with prospect research. You don't necessarily have to have a system an actual system that you bought and paid for to do your prospect research. You just have to have a system that you use, that you've created, that works for you and the way that you fundraise. That is more important. So reasons, these are your reasons to perform prospect research. You wanna discover new donors, of course. You wanna learn which organizations your donors already give to and similar causes. You wanna gain insight into fundraising opportunities. You wanna save time. One way to save time is annual reports. When I'm researching competitor organizations for a nonprofit, annual reports is one of the number one ways that you can see who is giving to, who, which donors they're celebrating and how much they're giving, which tier and bracket they fall into, okay? That's one of your very best tools to use. So you save time once you do your prospect research. You can formulate a better ask and requesting major gifts from the right prospects. Listen, I swear a major gift is an art and it's something that you can spend a lot of time on and to streamline your time and to make it easier, you wanna do your prospect research. You wanna obtain clean donor data, update whatever database you are using, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're drawing from data that's up to date and current. One of the questions I receive is how often do we do that? Well, you can do it once a year, you can do it twice a year. I have an organization that does it monthly. That's because they have the people to do so. That is not something that may work for you but to do it on a regular basis, whatever you consider regular, is very important, okay? Traditional methods of performing prospect research. Now, this is one of two of the ways that you can perform it is by looking at real estate ownership. This is a statistic at the bottom where it says donors who own two million or more in real estate are 17 times more likely than the average person to give to a cause. Okay, all of this comes from giving reports that you see online. Real estate ownership is one of the ways where if you do purchase a database, they'll have this information in there. It's very easy to obtain just by Googling this information. Institution involvement, board and foundation members typically understand the importance of supporting organizations financially. 
Okay, so you want to make sure that if you can draw from your board's expertise, okay, who are their colleagues, their alumni, anywhere you can draw from that way. Those are your traditional methods. Employer information. Donors likely have colleagues who make similar salaries and also engage in philanthropy. Okay, your employer information, personal information, hobbies, marital status, basic contact information. Why did I include personal information in this? Because I found a donor on Twitter who had a picture of him at a gala in the area. I used that to make my ask for the organization I was representing because I already knew what was important to him, what, what he was interested in just by looking at that gala picture from another organization. I found that through social media, approached him through LinkedIn and had a conversation. That is the new way that you do your prospect research. So my method of prospect research, individual giving, LinkedIn or Google alerts. Now, let me explain Google alerts. This is very important. The way that I find those pictures on Twitter, the way that I find what's happening in the region for the company that I'm representing to see who's giving to what programs is I will do a Google alert. I'll give an example. I'm in the Houston area. If I want to know um, who has attended the latest gala for an organization with similar causes, I will create a Google alert. So I receive that information in my inbox, any pictures posted, any news articles, anywhere that a name might come up of a donor who has given to a similar initiative. You can receive that through Google alerts. I have, I don't know how many I have set up, but it's quite a few, okay? And it's an easy way for you to receive the latest information on what's going on. LinkedIn. I want to talk about LinkedIn for a second because LinkedIn has a feature that used to be called nonprofit interests. And I believe they changed the name to community interests. You do not need to have a LinkedIn premium account to use this feature. It is available to you right now. So LinkedIn, what you do is you go to the community interest section. You can Google it if you have trouble navigating within LinkedIn. And it will have where you can choose to look at people in a certain region who are interested in serving on a board or interested in volunteering. I have found volunteers through LinkedIn using the community interest feature. It is free and available to you. That's another way to prospect research. Volunteers are important because volunteers are your very best donors. It's easy for them to donate. It's easy for them to be invested in your cause because they're already giving you something valuable and that's their time, okay? Personal summary. I'll do a personal summary when I find all of my information so I can understand before I make the ask. Their philanthropic history, what they had given to before. That's where your Google Alerts comes in. That's where your annual reports come in. Information that you can find online and of course their contact information. All of this I would put into a database with very good notes, okay? With funders, it's board affiliation, giving history, annual report, funder guidelines, and contact information, okay? Candid.org, I will do my research on there as well, okay? So you use that information to do what? to make the ask. This is your fundraising script that we're gonna talk about later. Your first and follow-up communication. That is what you're doing with your prospect research. It's your first communication and then it's your follow-up because every ask that I have, I have to have a follow-up. I use the same information to do that. And of course you use it to cultivate relationships. So you wanna connect with people who are your allies to whatever industry your nonprofit represents. So I want you to consider the following candidates 
when you are online looking for people to buy into your initiatives to support your programs, okay? We are a socially driven world. So I want you to keep this, this open mind about reaching out to certain uh, people on social media, on social networks who are engaging in your content because they could be your next donor, okay? But I put these people in categories and I wanna show you them. So the candidates, you are answering the question, who can I connect with that is passionate about my industry? The reason I ask you this is because I'm a grant reviewer. And I remember probably two years ago, I received my first application that asked for our Twitter handle. An application that I received a few months after that asked, how were we going to promote them on social media that they gave to our organization? How were we going to promote them? Donors are asking, you know, which so social media account are you on? What is the, what's your presence? You know, how often do you post? If it's generational giving, you better believe you'll have this question from certain generations asking you about your proof, your social proof, your presence online. First candidate is Wendy Ryder. Wendy lives on social media writing thought-provoking posts. Wendy has a moderate following and doesn't mind sharing great content. I would be a Wendy writer, okay? I have nonprofits send me all type of information, all type of posts that they want me to repost or comment on, okay? I'm not the only Wendy writer out there for sure. There are other people, your ambassadors already who are engaging in your content, part of your newsletter list or your volunteers, who want to be your Wendy writer and they're happy to do so, okay? They don't mind sharing your content. All of this, the remote fundraising, it's to get exposure so you can get those donations. The exposure comes first. Second candidate is sharing Sam. Sam loves sharing content that's important to him and he only comments or shares other posts and does not necessarily write his own. He's a mean posting, gift generating type of person. When I am busy and I see something that a nonprofit has posted that I'm already supporting or that I, I know about, I know their history, if I see it, I'll hurry up and share it and just move on. I won't say anything about the nonprofit, I don't have time, but I at least want to support them in sharing. There are a lot of sharing Sams. Okay, and I have a certain category on LinkedIn of these people that I know if I send them something that they will get the word out there. This is how you build, okay, your online presence. Irene Influencer. Irene's social media influence is the stuff dreamer made, dreams are made of. I am not talking about the influencer that you may be <laughs> thinking about right now on certain social networks. I am referring to a person where if you have something online, a post, and they have an article that is talking about the same initiative and the same gap that you're filling with your mission as a nonprofit, that is an influencer, okay? There are certain causes that are very near and dear to my heart. I am an influencer for that nonprofit to connect with me and I can help them share their message. That is the type of influencer I'm about, that I'm talking about. Who can you connect with that is passionate about your industry? Freddie the fan. Freddie represents your supporters. He is the backbone of your digital presence. Nine times out of 10, Freddie is already a volunteer, okay? This is a great way to use your volunteers and to use their expertise, especially if it's in the tech or social media space. Freddie DeFan loves your ideas and they wanna see you win. Your supporters have their own network too. One of the easiest ways to use, a, um, to have Freddie, Freddie the Fan help you is if you have a campaign, I recommend this to all clients. If you have a current campaign, Use it as a Facebook event that's connected to the Facebook page that represents your organization. Put the dates of the campaign 
And once you have that out there, people can click that they're going or that they're interested in it. Every time somebody clicks that, their network is notified. Okay. Every time their network clicks it, their net, do you, do you see where I'm going with this? It is exposure. It is getting your message out there. So virtual donor engagement. What is virtual donor engagement? It's an online strategy to gain donor support in the form of donations, volunteers, or exposure. So there's a 4P method of engagement. We're getting to the three T's, but this is all before you get there. So you wanna make a point, you wanna provide proof and share your perspective, okay? I wanna show you about point, provide proof and perspective. This is how you engage. First up, you wanna keep your message brief to the point and compelling. Let's face it. We can scroll all day as human beings and be distracted by 10 different things. You know, if I see a dog or cat video, I can spend 30 minutes on the video saying, oh, isn't that cute? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And 30 minutes have gone by, okay? It is distractions that we are scrolling all the time. What you want to do is you wanna make your point and you wanna make it fast. This goes for your digital communications, this goes from when you do your fundraising script on your own, okay? Because one of the handouts will help you create your script, okay? When you do that, you want to get to the point. You want to provide. You want to focus on providing the information they want to know, not on what you have to say. This changed the game for me and my success as a fundraiser. When I stopped worrying about what I was wearing, uh, what they were looking at, what I was gonna have cooked for dinner that night, all of this stuff that goes through your mind as a brand new fundraiser, even if you're seasoned, you, you worry about what you need to provide in that ask. As a remote fundraiser, how are you going to do that, okay? You focus on the information that they wanna know, not on what you wanna say. You wanna generate social proof. Use LinkedIn. I have mentioned LinkedIn a hundred times and I promise you, I don't work for them. They're not giving me any money. It is a resource for you to use LinkedIn. It is valuable, okay? Less noise on LinkedIn than the other networks and it's a little more focused on professionalism. So you wanna start following prospects, receive their updates. I do this five days of the week. Following prospects, receiving their updates, using hashtags to see who's talking about the initiatives that an organization th of, that I'm representing. You want to do this on a constant basis. And after a while, with the LinkedIn algorithm, you'll start seeing people that are just talking about what you're interested in. So it really becomes easy. Perspective. You wanna share the behind the scenes content and snippets of day-to-day -day operations. How do you do this? Instead of sending a newsletter, do a Zoom briefing. You can do 10 minutes on what's going on with your organization. That same video can give you two to three months worth of social media posts. That's one of the number one questions I receive is what am I gonna post on social media? Video, you can break up, you can use those words, you can use graphics, all of that. You can use it, you can create an entire Giving Tuesday campaign on a 10 minute video. Duplicate your efforts. So point, provide proof and perspective, okay? Any questions on that, let me know. And before we go to sensitivity and modern day fundraising, Anne, do we have any questions? We've got one question, Crystal. Um, Linda was asking about how do you create a Google alert? Do you have any recommendations there? Yeah, and what I can do, um, if you are, great question. What I can do is send you some information on how to create your Google Alert. If you're gonna send the uh, handouts and the um, presentation to them, I can send that to you, Anne, and you can include it in that. Great, okay, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to include that um, after yeah, because the webinar, we'll have some additional tips there. 
is kind of a process to perfect it. And I will say, I'm glad she asked this question because when you first do your Google Alerts, the first week you will receive information that has nothing to do with what you're interested in. So it takes a while for Google to really perfect that alert. After a month, then you will kind of see it slow down and the alerts you receive will be more valuable than in the first few weeks. So absolutely, I can send you that information. Okay. And then Lindsay said, hey, can you also share the um, the link to the LinkedIn community interest? Uh, yes. Lindsay's having trouble locating it. So I'm not surprised. Thank you so much for the question. I'm not surprised because it's Ever since they stopped with the title nonprofit interest, it's harder to locate. So I have a screenshot and a little video, maybe it's 30 seconds, that I can send the, send you that you can include in the package. Okay, we've got Google Alerts and LinkedIn Community Interest, how we find that. We will include that in the packet we send after, along with the webinar, the recording and the slides and everything. So I, there's a lot of people saying, yes, yes, please send, please send. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Isn't it great to get stuff free? It's still free. Yeah. So use it. Awesome. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So let me go back here. And we're going to talk about sensitivity in modern day fundraising. And let me move my Zoom stuff. There we go. Okay. So this is the poll question. Okay that you've probably already answered, but how has fundraising changed for you in the last three years? Yep, so go ahead and answer the, the poll question was pushed out to you. So we'll give you a, well, I'll watch the, I'm watching the results come in. And then um, Crystal too, like if you don't see something on here, go ahead and chat in to use the chat function yes please do as Absolutely. well uh, we'll wait till we get a good we've got about half of our participants have um submitted their answers so we'll just give you maybe about 10 15 more seconds for yeah, absolutely getting capacity here so again how has fundraising changed for you in the last three years Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get your vote in if you haven't. I'm going to push in poll and we'll um, share the results. All right, so let's see. How has fundraising changed for you in the last three years? And we have virtual fundraising is number one. I figured it would be. Mm -hmm. Next is a stronger social media presence. Let me tell you, I have more nonprofits embracing this finally, <laughs> finally, because we don't, we don't really have a choice at this point. I mean, it's where people live. Okay. So social media presence. Next is mobile technology. I was talking with Ann before the webinar about this mobile technology, very important. You can take part of your newsletter and do it mobile less effort, less time, and you eventually will have more engagement. Because remember when you start something new, you need to have, you need to allow people to have time to get used to the idea, okay? Because this is all new for us. And let's see, after that, diversifying funding portfolio, giving for multiple generations, okay? So mobile, virtual, and diversifying. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the few ways. Thank you so much. And Alishiva, ask your question, absolutely. And at the next break, I'll answer it. All right, thank you so much, Ann. And I see Carly says, a big change for us, we're launching an NFT campaign. Boy, this is a work, that's a world that I'm learning day by day. So I would be very interested to see how that works for you. Uh, okay, and Maria says I'm new in the fundraising world, so everything is new. Good. I hope you're hope you're getting value from this. So, I'm going to talk about the ways that fundraising has changed for me in the last few years. Okay, digital fundraising, success storytelling, celebrating hiding wins, 
This is a very important question that I have received ever since 2020, okay? Participation versus loyalty and generational giving. Digital fundraising, the use of mobile giving, text to give, and online forms have increased. Why is this a sensitive topic? Because some of your donors are not receptive to this form of giving. I have even heard, you know, Crystal, I'm not sure that this is the right fit for this company. This is from a donor telling me this. <laughs> okay, you know, we, we just shouldn't even do mobile giving. It's stupid. Like, why, why are you doing that? Because it's an e once it's set up, it's an easier way to get more donations into that nonprofit. It has value. And I tell you, it has more value now in the last three years than ever before. Because when I first heard about this, I thought it was the craziest thing. What I would um, suggest that each one of you do, if you are looking to start mobile giving, do your due diligence with the company that you choose, okay? There are so many now for you to choose from, but do your research, absolutely. Social media's influence. Remember Freddie the fan, Wendy the writer, Irene the influencer? This is where this come in. Social media posts and comments will live online forever and in someone's head. Be careful of what you say. Story time is simply a quick little simple story that you have to remember that your presence is everything online. Everything you write, everything you post will live forever. Sometimes controversial things get more attention than valuable things like your mission and the vision of your nonprofit, okay? If you're tied to your organization's page and you have a special profile for that, remember that you are connected to that page. I have seen some very devastating outcomes with employees with organizations posting certain things, even liking certain things, commenting, all of that, okay? That's the story, okay? So be careful what you post online. Your influence is important. You are your first influencer. Everyone else that comes, Irene, Wendy White Ryder, Freddie the Fan, all of that, they're looking at your influence first. Celebrating and hiding wins. The reason I put this into this presentation and not the ones previously is because the question that I get asked most often, well, ever since COVID, we have received an influx of donations. Should we hide that we're doing very good? Should we hide that? Because we feel like our donors are not, are gonna think we don't need them anymore. When nonprofit professionals ask if they should celebrate their wins and notify donors of how well they're doing, I ask them to take a different approach. Segment your donor database. Segmenting your donor database could be a whole nother presentation. Um, and it is that important. And it is very, very valuable to your fundraising efforts. I am helping you streamline. That's what I wanna do. So you have more time to do other things. And select potential donors versus sending a mass email. So you wanna segment. Share with your major donors, okay? And select potential donors versus sending a mass email. Why do you want to do that? Because sometimes your wins will be perceived that way, especially within the last three years. Well, they don't need me. You know, they, they don't need this donation. You know, I'll donate to something else. That is sometimes the thought process of some donors. With your major donors who are more invested, there seems to be, in my experience, more of an understanding that you are winning. So you want to customize your approach to key leaders and top donors. It makes your good news more memorable. Okay. And then you can share broad news on uh, social media. You want to save your intricate, detailed news briefings for your uh, Zoom briefings, your newsletters, and the like. Okay, participation versus loyalty. 
there's a shift in fundraising where loyalty is still important, of course. Participation is gaining traction. Social networks, social networks, social networks. Listen, people, we have arrived. Okay, we, we are here. Social networks are here to stay. One may replace the other in popularity, but it is a great way to gain new donors. Generational giving. I wanted you to have this graphic when you receive the presentation to look at the core values of a generational giver, okay? I'm Gen X. I agree with almost everything that it says about me. <laughs> um, but yeah, task-oriented, pragmatic, prioritized work and life balance. You know, it has all of the core values of that giver. And of course, this is going to change, you know, as new generations come. Communication. One of the number one questions I am asked is how often, how often should we contact our donors? This is going to help you answer that question. I always have a rule of thumb. If you're doing nothing now, twice a month is good to start. Okay, if that is too taxing for you, once a quarter is great. The only thing with once a quarter is whatever you are sending for that quarter has to be robust and it has to include a lot of information, okay, to get them to click and for them to stay in that newsletter, okay, very important. So your frequency, that, that's the first thing you need to determine. Then you need to determine how much information you're going to give them. Block scheduling. This is my block scheduling on a typical day, okay, for fundraisers, okay? I want you to take what is applicable for you because I always get a time management question. How do I manage my time? How do I manage it? Let me tell you something. I am giving you the ideal here a day can start with, there are five fires I need to put out. And all of this right here will not even happen. There are days like that. This is a typical regular day where there are very minimal fires that I need to put out. So morning, I always do my prospect research in the morning. Social media research, my weekend roundup. What am I doing? I'm reviewing fundraisers events, even online that have happened over the weekend for the region, whatever organization I'm representing. Emails, phone calls, follow-ups, morning, morning, morning. I am aware of time differences, so I will do it whatever morning is for them, okay? If it's the West Coast, of course, I'll wait a bit. Lunchtime, Zoom briefings, live streams. This is when I'll do Zoom briefings for organizations. What is a Zoom briefing? It is a video newsletter. It's a video that you create. You can use Zoom or anything else. You can create it. You can take that, use the audio as a podcast, okay? One organization, they use all the audio Zooms as podcasts. They call them podcasts. Why not? Okay? Or they'll use the video. They'll post that online. They'll use it in all of their marketing materials. They'll use it for everything. That's a Zoom briefing. Goes a little further than a newsletter. Live streams. Any live streams that I'm doing, I'll do them at lunchtime. Why? Because that's when most employees are kind of taking a break. Even if you don't have a lunch and you're working through it, you may have something going on in the background. Okay, it can play in the background. If you're responsible for your organization and doing the marketing and the social presence, then this is a good, good schedule for you. Afternoon is virtual meetings, okay? Meetings in the afternoon, what is this? When I make the ask, okay? People who couldn't meet me in the morning or they wanna do Zoom, I'll block the entire afternoon and do one after the other. This is a typical schedule of what I have. I understand that most of you are wearing, like I said, 15. I may want to raise it to 20 hats, okay? Take from this what you will and make it work for you. One thing I do want to say before we get to the three T's, I have received, I have more successful ask 
in the morning than any other time. That's why I prefer morning. Am I a morning person? No, I just have to be. <laughs> I'm forced to be. I'm forced to be a morning person. So morning is what works best. Go ahead and ask your questions because I will answer them at the end of the presentation. Absolutely. So I see a few coming in. So ask away. So tact, tone, and timing. I put this graphic in here because, I mean, this is poetic. This is exactly where we are now. I cannot believe it is August 2022. I remember New Year's Day, and it is August already. Okay. Pivot in your communication. You still want to have messaging that's focused on the um, impact that the pandemic had on your organization. It is messaging that is going to live on, I think, for a few years that you can use in your social media efforts. You can tell people how you rose out of the ashes, if you will, and how you overcame the challenges you've had. One thing that I am known for with donors that I was told not to do in the beginning of my career is to not share so many challenges. The more I share challenges, the more successful my ask is. It really is. When I make the ask, I always include the challenges that we're facing. It's not always rainbows. And donors need to know that. You want your messaging focused on your mission and help fulfilling it. And this slide should have include vision as well. Your mission and vision is always what you push in your ask. Messaging focus on the shift in services and operational changes. If you have add additional people, if you have lost people, whatever has happened, I pivot that in my communication, make it on a positive note and let them know what's going on. That is the most feedback that I receive. You know, thank you for your message. Uh, can we set up a meeting? Uh, what else is going on in your organization? How is, you want to start engaging them to ask you questions, okay? Your excitement about your projects and programs will resonate with the donor. A simple exercise to help you in communication, visit your website, mission, vision, program services, client testimonials, annual reports, statistics. I use all of these when I create my fundraising script. So tact, tone, and timing, tact. The definition of it is sensitivity in dealing with others or difficult issues. Look, you don't have to go far to figure out who has been through something within the last three years. Your donors are humans too. I do my research online to see if I can find anything before I contact that donor. When conversing with donors, remember how the world has changed in the last few years. Tact can make or break the ask. It really can. I, I have seen it happen and it has made me change the way I do fundraising. Your tone. Your voice and words control the conversation. Look, I don't have to be the first to tell you that I'm a pretty direct gal uh, when I talk to people and pretty extroverted. Sometimes I have to tone that down because not all donors are receptive to that, okay? It depends. I can be introverted, I can be extroverted. I guess that makes me an ambivert. Know who you are and watch your tone when you're talking to donors. Tact tone, your timing. Be strategic in your process when communicating with the donor. Know what time of day, know when you can contact them. How are you going to know that? If they post online, that's your first guess. That's when they're active. That's when they're receptive to it. Sometimes you won't know what the timing, but you want to be strategic in it if you can. If you already have a donor database where you all have notes in it and everyone can see the notes, sometimes that needs to be in the notes. That's sometimes the first place I go to for it. 
So when you create your virtual fundraising script, there are five parts, okay? You can have 52 parts to your uh, script. You can have 15, but this is the five parts you need to have. I have it every time I make the ask, the introduction. You're answering three questions. The fourth, I'm gonna talk about that, but the three. Who is your community, your demographic? How do you serve your community, your services? Where is the gap, your mission and vision? Why do you exist? Those are the three questions you need to answer. The last one is how the donor can help. This is your moment. This is when you make the ask. That is your virtual fundraising script. You can have this in an email. You can do it on Zoom. That's the remote part or in person. But that is your script. I stay true to this script 80% of the time. That other 20% is when I have to change it, when I have to throw it out because none of it's gonna work for that certain type of donor. They just wanna have a conversation. It depends on the type of donor you're dealing with. So remember, when you're creating your fundraising script, people care less about the titles and more about the reason you're requesting a phone call or a meeting with them. I have secured more asks in the morning than any other time. Ask for financial support or extend an invitation. If you don't have an event coming up, if you're doing something virtually, even if it's a podcast, I don't care what it is, invite them. You need a reason to get in front of them again. That's your reason. What is the donor's giving history? How do you find that out? Candid.org, pros perform prospect research. Online campaigns. We're going to go through these steps, and then I'm going to answer your questions. So online campaigns, five steps to creating an online campaign. Now with this, there could be 500 steps, okay? If you're doing something like an online gala where you have sponsors and food involved and all of that, it could be definitely more steps than this. These are your five basic steps. Number one, you wanna plan. What's your timeline? I live and breathe by the timeline for an event. It's the first thing I wanna craft because I go by that. Your promotion, how are we promoting the event? Do you remember when I talked about Wendy Ryder, Freddie the Fan, your online presence, Facebook events, all of that stuff, LinkedIn, community interests, which you will receive that information. All of that is your promotion, your ticketing and fees, a dedicated event page, okay? Sometimes you can do that within your donor database, or again, you can do it events online. Number two is your logistics. You can partner with local restaurants. This is for a online gala that you're doing. How does that work? You partner with a local restaurant or a chain that's in your area per se. You get a discount or food in kind, and then you refer people to that. And when it's time to have your gala, people log online, they see a briefing from the executive director or whoever represents your organization, program and services, you show a video, and then that's pretty much it. It's an online type of gala. Pretty cool idea. I've seen it work. It works best when you have, let me back up, your timeline, your timeline in place. This isn't something that you can throw together. Okay. Also, I've seen it with local entertainment. They'll do a video and they can show that video as entertainment. Online auctions is a thing as well. Number three is communication. Before the event, promotion and sales. During the event, have a hashtag. Hashtag can make or break your online presence when you're having these online events. After the event, say thank you. The campaign results your social media shout outs. When you bring everything online, you have to stick to the schedule and do your before, during, and after. Networking, very important step. You wanna live stream activities throughout different parts of the event. You wanna ask your attendees to take photos and use an event designated hashtag. 
hashtags are still a thing, okay? It's the number one way if I'm looking for a grant online for someone posting about a grant opportunity, I'll use certain hashtags to find it before I even go to all of the websites to look for grants, okay? Include one-on-one -on -one video chats between your staff and volunteers. Ask community stakeholders to promote your event. As a grant reviewer, one of the things that I will look at online is your presence and kind of see what you're posting. Hashtags have a lot to do with that, especially if you have an event on your website and I see that you've had a past event, I'll go all over social media looking, looking for the impact of that particular event. Number five, assign your roles. This should be on your timeline, your leaders, your volunteers, your backup crew. What does a backup crew do online? They pretty much have this uh, technology, your statistics, how many people are um, you know, tweeting about it, talking about it. That's your backup crew, okay? Should be a tech crew. Follow up committee. You wanna follow up, okay? Sometimes your funding is in your follow up. Very, very important step. So any questions? I know I threw a lot at you and it was a lot to learn, but we have um, the sort of ask, the fundraising system that I created is all, everything that you have learned is based on that system. And also, if you want your questions answered twice a month, you can text me questions and I will answer them. I send it twice a month to my text community. So you can hold your phone up to the uh, QR code or you can text fundraising to that number. Either way, you'll be in and you'll get your questions answered. All right, so I'm gonna go to questions, Ann. We have a lot of questions here. So let's see if we can get through them. Um, Julia asked, I run the annual giving for my entire organization. My boss handles the major gifts. Would you recommend avoiding mass emails and instead focusing on sending more targeted emails to your donors, both for solicitations and for updates, positive messages, et cetera? Okay, keep this one up for a second. Oh, oh. did it go and answer? Hang on, I'll go to my answer tab. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. I see it. That's okay. I okay, see got it. it. Yep. All so. right, thanks, Julia. All right, let's see. Okay, your first part of the question, avoid mass emails. Absolutely, very good. You want to send a special email, Zoom briefing, whatever you want to your major donors. They need to receive something different and something special. You want to focus your email when you do send it to them on, remember celebrating and hiding wins? You wanna have your celebrations in there don't hide it. I recommend that you don't, which are major donors. They understand it's a different concept with major donors. And you ask and say, both for solicitations and for updates. Updates, positive messages, yes, we covered that one. The solicitations, they need to be broken out. Your major donors, your monthly donors, volunteers who aren't donors yet, you want to segment all of that. Absolutely. Great question. Uh, let's see, what's the next? Great. Uh, Veronica, we've got kind of on the topic of Zoom briefings. So I've got um, LaShondra, Veronica have asked a couple kind of a, well, a multi-part, but related to Zoom briefings. So how do you handle Zoom fatigue with the briefings? And then, you know, how often should we be having the Zoom briefings or live streams? Perfect. Okay. So <laughs> This is a good question because I feel like I'm on Zoom every day except Sunday. So I understand Zoom fatigue. Uh, I'm gonna answer the first one is how often? I would recommend if you've never done a Zoom briefing, which is your newsletter taken online in video. Like I'm talking to you now, this would be a Zoom briefing where I'm introducing myself, talking about the organization, talking about our wins, okay? And then you can end with the ask. Do you see how your fundraising script is forming? It's just in a Zoom briefing. That's your exact same fundraising script, okay? It can stick, it, stick to 10 to 20 minutes, no more than 20. 
I had one organization do an hour and a half and I was like, nobody's going to listen to that. Nobody, nobody is going to listen to that. Stick the 10 to 20 minutes for your Zoom briefing. I promise you, you can squeeze it all within that time. Okay, even less is good. Five minute Zoom briefings, if you want to start out, put that on your website, put it in your newsletter. If you're going to do text to give, put a link to it and put it on all of your social networks. Use it for Giving Tuesday. You see how you can duplicate one effort? That's the way you do that. So, so let's talk short style videos for a second. So Veronica was asking about also, is it easier to do TikTok style short videos? Yes. And it's so funny because at some point, Veronica, I am going to have to put TikTok within these presentations because nonprofits are already using it for donations. They're all because think about when we talked about generational giving, younger generations are giving. Don't, don't think that they're not. So that is a way for that short style TikTok video that you can use to get your message out there. Again, the link to that, where are you going to put that? On your website, in your social networks, in your newsletter, that one video. If you have 10 videos on there, you can take what's said in those videos and make it two months of social media posts from those 10 videos. There's no reason to duplicate your efforts. Take those two months worth of social media posts, flip them, change the days, and do two more months. I do it all the time with organizations. Great question. Yeah, we've got a great question um, from Alishava. Uh, I used to raise money with a white woman as a co-director, and she's now started her own emergent justice, and I can't raise money like I could before. So any recommendations there? Yes. So what we're getting into now is diversity fundraising. And so there are a couple of organizations, Brown Philanthropy, there is a uh, a couple more where they talk about how diversity and fundraising is changing. One of the things that funders want to see, they will ask for your DEI policies, what you are doing to make sure that it's equitable for everybody to participate in your organization, to get your services. Your statistics have to include that. So when you're when you're contacting donors and when you're looking at certain donors who buy into your message and your organization, you want to look at donors who already know diversity is important. How do you find them? One of the ways that I do is LinkedIn because they're talking about these initiatives already. There is an, uh, a guy that I found on LinkedIn. He's a board member of a certain organization. He is always talking about diversity and fundraising, giving to certain programs. He became a donor for the nonprofit I represented. He's already talking about it. This makes it easy. So have your DEI policy ready because they're asking for that just like they're asking for your social media handles. They wanna see it everywhere. So absolutely, I know it's a little different for you. So I hope that helps. No, that's great. Now we're coming up on time. So I just want to do a time check, Crystal. There's a few more questions here. We want to go ahead and, and take them. I feel like there's there's just some great stuff here. So you have the time, Crystal? I absolutely do. If, if you're okay with it, let's go. I'm okay. Let's keep going here. So Carrie was hoping maybe we could share an example of a script you've written and used successfully. So maybe that's something for the packet. That would be for the packet, and let me write that down, because okay. what I can give you, um, the information is private, but what I can give you is the breakdown of the script, the breakdown. So you can plug and play and put in your information. So that's definitely what I can do for you. So let me write that down. That's great. Script example. Great question. Yep. All right. Any suggestions on how to make a so social media challenge like the ice bucket challenge uh, from a few years ago successful and appealing to prospect donors? Yes, you want to start with TikTok. Any challenge that you do, you want to start with TikTok. And the same goes for TikTok. You remember Wendy Ryder, Freddie the fan, Irene the influencer. If you do a challenge video on something like TikTok or Instagram that are more challenge oriented, 
say, than Facebook, okay? If you do that, you want to have influencers repost that message, talk about it. That is the way that it will go viral, okay? You have to rely on your network because even though hashtags are still here, hashtags are going to eventually be replaced by influence. It's going to depend on your influence. So absolutely, that's how you should start with your challenge. Great. Um, so when it comes to hashtags, how important is it to be unique? Or can I get away with like an org initials plus the word strong or like ABC strong or what any recommendations for hashtags? Yes. When you do a hashtag, you want your organization first. So say the organization is uh, a Houston nonprofit. That was the name, right? You want to always use the location. Okay. Always be location specific. You're going to have more than one hashtag for your organization probably. So hashtag Houston nonprofit. Is, if the name of the profit is nonprofit is ABC nonprofit, you want to do hashtag ABC whatever, Houston. You want to be region specific. Then you want a hashtag that represents your programs. You have a food pantry. You want to have hashtag food pantry. And then you want to see hashtagify.com. I'll say that 10 times twice. Uh, but hashtagify will help you find related hashtags to a generic hashtag such as food pantry. Fundraising. You always want to use fundraising nonprofit, virtual, nonprofit with an S, all of that you always want to use because that will put you in a bucket where people are always researching those hashtags, always. You wanna have funders on the end. You want to use your region. Even if you're a national nonprofit, use your region. It's extremely important. All right, let's see the next one, ma'am. Uh, do donors use Candid when considering organizations to support? What I notice is they'll sometimes use um, Candid.org GuideStar. I still use GuideStar, even though um, they have merged. I'll use GuideStar. And then there is another one where we'll have a nonprofit score. The name escapes me right now, but they have a score for nonprofit organizations. They'll use that one as well. But you better believe your individual donors. You know the first thing they're doing before all of that? They're looking at your presence online. It's the same as <clears throat> it's the same as you going for a job interview. Okay. I apply for a job. The first thing they're going to look at is if I have a LinkedIn profile. If they even put my name in Google, LinkedIn will come up before my website and anything else. Okay. So they're they're researching a bunch of ways. They're researching your executive office and your board members. And if they have your name, they'll research you. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. We have two, two more questions and then we, we will need to wrap it up. You all, you're all absolutely lovely for staying on. And thank you, Crystal. Ariana is asking that she uses their organization currently uses black body tapestry for donor profiles. Is there a better platform you'd recommend to organize our donors into groups? I think it's related to donor segmentation. Bloomerang. <laughs> I did not pay you to say that, but yeah, I, I, regardless of the platform, you absolutely, yeah, Bloomerang's great for that. That's something that we talk a lot about is how you engage with your donors and making sure you segment and make it easy to communicate. Um, I will say, Ariana, really quick, uh, Bloomerang is great. There's other ones. E-Tapestry is a starter. The Razor's Edge is a little more costly. Um, it's a little more intricate. And then there's, you can attach the word donor to all the other ones I'll recommend. There's donor perfect, donor something else. There's a bunch of them. Do your research. Do your research. Yeah, definitely talk to us. I know our our sales organization, they're, they are um, customers and prospects tell us of how helpful they are in the process. So as you're researching, it's really important that they're like a guide for you. So if you have questions, you need help. Um, there's amazing uh, people out there that just want you to make sure that you get the best solution for what you're trying to go do. 
Um, I know that's that's a, a core value that that we care about. Really, uh, it's really important to to help you navigate that process. Last question: Veronica is asking, as a small organization with only five full time employees, how would you prioritize your fundraising approach? This is a great question, and it's a great one to end on. The first thing that I would do is use the 20 by five donor connection matrix that will be in your packet that I will send to Ann. It's five actions. You do 20% of the time. It's 100%. It, it's already out there in the stratosphere of the internet, but I will send you a clean copy to Ann so you can have it in your packet. This will help you and your four other employees. That's great. Um, we're getting awesome feedback. We're going to push out a quick poll question. Tell us, you know, raise your hand if you want to learn more from Crystal or you would love to learn more about Bloomerang. We'd be happy to help you. Um, really, really important. I'm. We're going to wrap it up today. You all have been wonderful in your questions and your engagement. Thank you so much. And a huge thank you to Crystal. Uh, absolutely fantastic. I learned a ton. And um, it was just a real joy. So thank you so much, Crystal, for sharing your, your knowledge with us today. And to all of you out there doing good in the world, please, please, please keep doing what you're doing. Um, it's so important that we fill these needs in our community. So thank you so much, everyone. And stay safe and have a fabulous rest of your day. Take thank care. Thank you so much, everyone. Nice seeing you, Anne. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.